folks, this is Pastor Mike Hawker coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We've been talking about the Northern Army. Now, I want to start with a place that probably a lot of people who have studied Bible prophecy before has looked into, a place in the Bible. I'm speaking of Ezekiel chapter 38, uh, where the Bible says in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog. Uh, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. A lot of scholars have looked into this and asked the question, who exactly is Gog? What is the land of Magog? And so on. And I think there's a clue. Here. Some say it's Russia. Some, I don't think it could be the Canadians. I don't think it would be them. But from, And I explain myself here in a minute. But there's one clue in this verse uh, that I just read where he sets his face against Gog and he calls him the chief prince of Meshach. Now that word in itself or that phrase chief prince leads me to believe that we're not talking about someone from earth or just a regular man. Because Ephesians 6 tells us that we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, those four grouped together, we are wrestling against spirits, devils, evil angels, the fallen angels, or whatever you want to call them, the little gods, all right? That's who we're wrestling against. And we have evidence in the scripture like we have the prince of the people of Persia mentioned in the book of Daniel. We have Michael the prince who is a, a, a sort of a guardian prince over the people of Israel. Um, we have also in Ezekiel where it talks about the prince of Tyrus but then it calls him the anointed cherub that covereth. So we're thinking that's that's got to be Lucifer. That's got to be the devil. So in my mind Gog, now there may be human nations involved in this, but I think Gog himself is no ordinary man. I think he is a very high ranking evil spirit. Now the reason why I bring this into this discussion is because of the particular direction that Gog and his army is supposed to come from. We find that in verse 15. And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land that the heathen may know me, when I shall be sanctified in thee, O Gog, before their eyes. Now, I want us to, to put our thinking caps on. That's what my used teacher used to tell me when I was in little grade school. And we all used to go like that, got my thinking cap on. And I want us to think about what, because if we believe the Bible's right in everything that it says, we believe the Bible is literal in everything it says. I do. I can't imagine a war in the 21st century century being fought by men riding horses. Now, the 17th century, the 18th century, yes. 16th century, 100th century, 400 BC, I can see armies coming in riding on horses, but we're in the 21st century. We're living in the days of tanks, armored vehicles, Humvees, jets, atomic bombs, you name it. We've got rockets, we've got, we've got laser weapons now. I mean, we've got it all, right? Why is this army such a big threat when all they do is just come in riding on horses? So I don't think that the horses that they're talking about are just normal earth horses. I think they are spirits. And I'm going to 
the reason why I bring all this up, and that, that could be for like a later, something we can talk about later. The reason why I bring this up is the direction that Gog is coming from. Specifically says, thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts. Um, thou and many people with thee, all of them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army. And again, some people might say, well, you know, Ezekiel didn't know what a tank was. He didn't know what a, a rocket was. He didn't know what a Jeep was. So he saw that and thought it was a horse. Or something. See, I don't buy into that either. Because we have to remember something. These are not Ezekiel's words. They're God's. God is the one who gave the words. Remember, he wrote them all in a book and told Ezekiel to eat the book. And he said, now you've got my words. Now tell everybody what I said. So this is the reason why I call this particular series the Northern Army. We're dealing with extraterrestrial, meaning they are not from this earth. We're talking about alien beings. Again, meaning, meaning they did not de derive from this earth. We are talking about gods, devils, principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, and a particular group of them that a lot of people claim they have seen. And we're going to sort of tap into some of those stories from John Mack and others about what people have seen. They've seen, they describe seeing well-built, sometimes tall, sometimes about the average height of a, of a tall man, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Something about the eyes that was just mesmerizing to them, that was just different. Um, fair complected, like the Aryan race that Hitler, the master race that Hitler wanted to create to take over and dominate the earth. So when the Bible is telling us that they're coming from the north, I don't believe that they're coming from like, Santa Claus in the North Pole or Canada or Russia. I think they're coming from a little bit farther up than the North Pole. And from that idea, I get that from Ezekiel chapter 1. Because Ezekiel is among the captives by the river Shabar. And he says in verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. And then he goes on to describe this chariot of angelic beings. The chariot literally is made out of angelic beings, even with wheels within wheels, and there is God sitting on that chariot. And the Bible says that God... Um, sitteth upon or rides a chariot of 20,000 angels, all right? So I think the north in the Bible relates to a place that is far above and beyond this world. I think it's from the heavens. That's where I believe this chariot comes from. That's where I believe Gog is coming from. That's where I believe these Nordic aliens are coming from, and that is why I believe God told Jeremiah to set a pot on the fire and have the face of the pot toward the north. Let's see what he says. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 11, Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Jeremiah, what seest thou? And I said, I see a rod of an almond tree. Then said the Lord unto me, Thou hast well seen, for I will hasten my word to perform it. And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot, and the face thereof is toward the north. Notice verse 14. Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord. And they shall come, and they shall set everyone his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof, round about, and against all the cities of Judah. So, if we think beyond what we know to be the north, like the North Pole, where the, and to me it's interesting, it's always interested me when the Bible's talking about they're coming from the north and the kingdoms of the north, the, the north country, 
that there isn't any land at the North Pole. There's land at the South Pole, but there's no land at the North Pole. All there is is ocean water covered with a very thick layer of ice. And submarines can navigate through underneath that ice. So there's no land up there. There's, you know, I wouldn't say that there's no people up there. We, you know, I don't know how far North Eskimos live. But I guess when it comes to the North Pole itself, there's just nothing up there. There's never been a kingdom. There's never been a nation of people up there. So I think the Bible's telling us that the North is way beyond all the way up into the heavens. So this is the, the connection that I've been making this whole time in, in this series, is that when these people are seeing these Nordic looking aliens, I think the term Nordic doesn't just apply to the fact that they look like somebody from Sweden or Denmark. I think the term Nordic applies to the fact that that's where they come from, the North country. Uh, let me reintroduce you to a man by the name of John Mack. John Mack was, uh, he's now dead. He was a Harvard professor uh, and, and published. He won, uh, I think it was a um, Pulitzer Prize maybe for one of his books that he wrote. He's a Harvard psycho psychiatrist, very well educated. And if you're a Harvard person, whatever field it is that you study. If you're a Harvard person, that's sort of like the elite of the elite, unless you're from Yale, and then Yale and Harvard, they don't get along. It's sort of like Cambridge and Oxford in England, all right? So if you're a Harvard man, you are someone who is very well esteemed. You have to be pretty much the top of your field. John Mack was the professor of psychiatry at Harvard. He had written several books. He was a clinical psychiatrist. He had talked to people. As I've listened to John Mack speak in different you know, venues talking about what he did or what he ended up doing, John Mack's the kind of guy, if I had a psych psychiatric problem, I think I'd want to go see him. Okay? He just has a real smooth way of talking. He doesn't seem to look down at anybody. He just seems to be a plain, ordinary, really, really smart guy when it comes to figuring out human beings. John Mack is the one that when 62 children at an elementary school in Zimbabwe, Africa, saw a silver disc land in their play yard and these alien gray creatures came out and some of them made eye contact with some of these children and beamed images and ideas into these children's head, John Mack went from Harvard and flew all the way to Zimbabwe to interview these children. And when he came back, he said, they're not lying. There's no way that all 62 of these children telling me the exact same story, telling me that they had images beamed into their eyes or into their mind through the eyes of these aliens. He took them seriously. There's supposed to be a documentary film released. I don't know, it's, you can look it up on uh, YouTube or uh, internet somewhere. It's the Aerial School, Aerial Phenomenon is what the documentary is going to be called. Hasn't been released yet to my knowledge. I've been waiting for it because I want to see it. Because they went back and interviewed some of these students 20 years later and they're all telling the same story. We know what we saw. So that's who John Mack is. And John Mack actually, if you remember, he got in trouble because he got hooked up with a guy who had been hypnotizing and re doing regressions on people who said that they had been abducted by aliens. And so John Mack got interested in that and he started talking to some of these people, interviewing them, putting them under hypnosis, doing regression, and hearing their stories. And so he wrote a book on, ab on abductions called Abducted. And he almost got kicked out of Harvard for that, okay? Uh, Alan Dershowitz and all of these other Harvard professors got together and said, we, can't, we can talk about angels and devils and God, but we can't talk about aliens. They were going to throw him out. They decided to let him stay. Well, here's some things that John Mack said about the type 
of extraterrestrial aliens that these people that he interviewed have encountered during their abduction. Uh, John Max said in a YouTube interview, he said something significant and real is going on here. Has found its way from we know not what reality and is entering into our physical space and affecting the lives of, in our country alone, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. And again, that's from a YouTube interview with John Mack. Here's another interview. He was on a uh, TV talk show. This was a uh, John Mack TV interview, April 26, 1994. He said, people of sound mind, they've been taken on by some kind of energy through the walls of their home or the doors or their car, or in the case of children, from a playground, up into some kind of craft by these humanoid beings, subjected to a variety of procedures, examinations, and a whole set of reproductive-like procedures, as well as being shown either through telepathic communication or visually on monitors, scenes of the devastation of the earth, which reach them profoundly emotionally and come away with a powerful sense that the earth is in its last throes as a living organism. Now, let me break that down to you. Max said that these people, when they were taken up into the craft, some of them would be shown images like on a screen, just like the children in Zimbabwe. The gray aliens, when they made eye contact with these children, sent images of like the world on fire and the forests all burning and all the animals dying and basically scenes of Armageddon, the apocalypse, the end of the world. And that is a common theme from all the study that I've done from people that are in the UFO movement, say they've been abducted or they have researched those who have been abducted or researched the alien phenomenon or the UFO phenomenon or whatever. They are all saying almost near the exact same thing. The earth is headed toward a great and terrible disaster probably because men are driving fossil-fueled cars and spraying hairspray and destroying the ozone. We have global this, and I'm not kidding you. That's what people are coming away from these experiences with these devils, this idea that it's gonna, there's going to be a catastrophe happen on Earth, and the aliens are here to try to prevent it. They're going to try to stop it and save the earth. Remember uh, last week I told you about the, um, the day the earth stood still. The two motion pictures that were made, and both of them had the idea that mankind is hurting this planet. We need to get rid of all the humans on this. We know what spirit that is. So John Mack, this Harvard psychiatrist, who knows, he can tell when people's lying. Okay, It's not his first day on the job. He's done this for years. He's an expert at interviewing people and asking them certain questions, and they've all come back telling the exact same thing. Now, here's a quote from his book that he wrote, Abducted, about some of the aliens that people reported seeing on these ships. Inside the ships, the abductees usually witness more alien beings who are busy doing various tasks related to monitoring the equipment and handling the abduction procedures. The beings described by my cases are of several sorts. They appear as tall or short, luminous entities. Think of uh, angels appearing as angels of light that may be translucent or at least not altogether solid. Reptilian creatures, we've talked about that, have been seen that seem to be carrying out mechanical functions. And then he said, Nordic-looking, blonde, human-like beings are seen and human helpers are sometimes observed working alongside the humanoid alien beings. Let me read that again. Nordic-looking, blonde, human-like beings are seen along with human helpers. The Nordics. John Max said that along with the reptilians, 
the gray aliens, he always saw them accompanied with the Nordics, the blonde-haired, blue-eyed, Scandinavian-looking alien beings, the ones that several people say were, were really the ones that were in charge. A lot of people describe the gray aliens as almost like robots or automatons or like um, clones because they looked exactly alike and they were like doing all the functions, the slave work and everything. Remember, um, I, can't, I can't remember his name, but Travis Walton, his story was when he first woke up, he had grays over him and they ran away. And when he was trying to figure out where he was, that's when the tall blondes showed up and basically ejected him off of the ship. So even John Mack, talking, interviewing the various subjects that he's talked to, these people all saw these Nordic-looking alien creatures. And from last week, we saw the biblical evidence that these angels could look just like human beings. So they're called the Nordics because of their parents, but I also believe they're called the Nordics because that's where they're from. They are part of the northern army that will invade this world. Let me take you back to Betty Andreessen. We did a whole series just on her because her story just really got my attention because remember, she's the one where this gray alien comes out and she's about 12 years old, something like that. And a little blue sphere comes out of his little button on his uniform and flies around her head and taps her on the forehead and she falls backward like being slain in the spirit. Okay, you remember Betty Andreessen who was taken to see the one? And I'm telling you that the one is none other than the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist. That's who she saw. She also reported seeing very tall, Nordic, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, angelic-type beings that accompanied the little gray aliens that she was always accompanied with. They're the ones that accompanied her to go see the one. So let's go back and look at something that she said in her book, The Lifting of the Veil. In fact, if you look, she actually drew a picture of these Nordic North Country Aliens on the front of her book, Lifting the Veil. Here's what she said. These, she called them the elders. Betty had several encounters with tall, white-haired angels whom she called the elders. One evening, get this now, one evening in a Pentecostal church service where she received the gift of tongues, stop right here. I don't want to make anybody mad. But I know what the gift of tongues is, according to Scripture. According to Scripture, the gift that God poured out on the day of Pentecost was known, understandable, human languages. That's what they were, because everybody said, How hear we in our own tongue wherein we were born the Word of God? How is it we can hear this? That's what tongues are. Anybody that tells you that tongues is a, it's a mystery secret language that you utter, that you have no idea what you're saying, that it's the, it's the angel, it's the tongue that angels speak. Let me tell you where that came from. That came from John D. John D. was an occultist back, oh, about three or four hundred years ago that started scrying, pulling up familiar spirits, and he was talking to these devils, sort of blonde blue-eyed angel looking guys that were telling him that the angel spoke a secret language called Enochian language that Enoch spoke it Adam spoke it and that with this language if you master this language it was the language that God used to create the universe so if you could master this language then you could create whatever you want and that's some of the same garbage that some of these charismaniacs tell I'm telling you, God warned us about an army that he was going to set loose on this earth. He says in Deuteronomy 28, 49, the Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth. 
As swift as the eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Betty Andreessen, you were set up, sister. I'm telling you. Let me, let me keep reading this. One evening in a Pentecostal church service where she received, quote, the gift of tongues, two of these elders were in the church at that time. These elders were always accompanying her every time she was summoned to stand before the one. And remember who the one is. It's Keanu Reeves, Neo, right? From the Matrix. No, the one is the Antichrist, the beast, 666. The, the mystery guy who would not let Betty remember her interactions with the one. Either that or she was too afraid to say it or whatever. And Betty said that these aliens talked a different language. She couldn't understand it. But, and she received a gift of tongues speaking an unintelligible, unknown language. Let me tell you about the gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit are listed in Isaiah chapter 11. And it makes it very clear that one of the gifts of the Spirit is the Spirit of understanding. So, if you're claiming, and I didn't mean to get off on this, but I just get stirred up. If you're claiming that you've got a heavenly prayer tongue between you and God that you're pronouncing things that you have no idea what you're saying, that, that doesn't match Scripture. I'm sorry, it doesn't match Scripture. Isaiah 11, verse 2, The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding. That, that's one of the seven spirits of God is understanding. And to say you speak a language that you don't understand, why did God translate this Bible for us if each one of us would have the gift of understanding tongues where we could just read it in Hebrew and Greek and we would understand everything it says? Anyway, but here's, here's Betty Andreessen's elders. You, you, you got to see this. What they did one day when she was with them it blew my mind. For this woman to experience this and still believe in her heart that these were sent from God, that these were angels of God, they were sent from God, she is God's missionary woman here on this earth to proclaim the coming of the one who she calls the creator, the one who contains in him the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the female Holy Ghost. Where do you read this? This is her description from her book, Lifting the Veil, about what she saw these Nordic aliens doing. The elders revealed that they are the ambassadors of O, capital O, capital H, which was the internal, external, and eternal presence. During one encounter with the elders, Andreessen said that six of them, it's an interesting number, formed a circle, raised the arms with their palms upward. Stop right here. H have you seen people do that in church? Right? Now, I'm not saying that if you've ever done that, you're Satan, worshiping Satan. I'm not saying that. Okay. There actually isn't any commandment in the scriptures about how we should worship God other than to do it in spirit and in truth. And when it comes to rituals, I'm not big on rituals because you can perform a ritual and not be in the spirit and not be in, in truth. You can just do it, go through the motions, and got what God is expected to do it because you did your tricks for him anyway so get get this that these six white blonde tall aliens are doing six of them formed a circle they raised their palms in the air 
And then notice what happened. Six of them formed a circle, raised the arms with their palms upward, and a beam of light came out of their foreheads, forming two interconnected triangles, which made a hexagram. Dun, dun, dun. She said, as they bowed their heads, a circular rim of light surrounded all six elders, and they began chanting in low voices, Oh, Oh, the H sound at the end was like a release of power from their mouth. The ritual the elders performed had the effect of using energy rings of amber-colored light, creating a large, bluish-purple orb of light. The elders handed Ed Dreesen the purple orb to carry while they journeyed to go see the one. As I held the large purple orb, I could see and sense something was definitely moving inside this strange ball of light. This mysterious orb, which had been created through the six elders, prays to all. Now, who in the devil is O? Who is that? There is nothing in this book about our God being called O. Hey, hey, O. Our, our heavenly O, nothing. But apparently she's equating O with God. Now let me tell you what m my little theory is on who O is. I think O, see they were chanting it repeatedly. You remember what our Savior taught us. See, this is, why, this is why we have to have our Bibles, people. And this is why we have to have a shield of faith to be able to defend ourselves against these fiery darts. Because if we didn't have this book, we'd be, we would be lost like she is and other people. Okay? But remember what Jesus said about chanting and repeating. He said, don't, when you pray, don't pray like the heathen pray with vain repetitions. For they think they'll be heard for their much speaking. Jesus said, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't follow the heathen. And they're chanting and repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating. Because that is exactly how people who do meditation or people who do uh, transcendental meditation or contemplative prayer, that's how they get their heads to where they can speak and hear from these familiar spirits. The, the O that they were chanting, I think, I could be wrong, but I think is related to this, the Om. You know, you've, if you've ever done yoga or you've ever practiced Eastern mysticism or anything like that or done transcendental meditation, some of you have, that's in your past, you sat, you wadded up, you did your finger thing and you went Om, Om, okay? That's what I think was going on here. And here's the Wikipedia article on Ohm. And, and, and by the way, guess what? Albert Pike talks about the Ohm in Morals and Dogma. Sure does. Because, you see, in Masonry, they talk about Hiram Abiff, the builder of the temple, okay, who was a real character from the Bible. But Pike said that we're saying his name wrong, and the Bible has his name wrong that Hiram isn't really Hiram, it's Kir Om. And he equated the last part of Hiram of Abiff's name with the chant Om from the Hindu religion. Not, I'm not making that up, that's in Morals and Dogma. Uh, om is a sacred sound and a spiritual symbol in Indian religions. In Hinduism, it signifies the essence of the ultimate reality, consciousness, or Atman. More broadly, it is a syllable that is chanted either independently or before a spiritual recitation in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. The meaning and connotations of Om vary between the diverse schools within and across the various traditions. It is part of the iconography found in ancient and medieval era manuscripts, temples, monasteries, and spiritual retreats, retreats in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. In Hinduism, Om is one of the most important spiritual symbols. 
It refers to Atman, or the soul, the self within, and Brahman, the ultimate reality, which is a devil, probably, the entirety of the universe, truth, divine, supreme spirit, cosmic principles, knowledge. The syllable is often found at the beginning and the end of chapters in the Vedas, the Upanishads, and other Hindu texts. It is a sacred spiritual incantation made before and during the recitation of spiritual texts, during puja and private prayers, in ceremonies of rites and passages, such as weddings, and sometimes during meditative and spiritual activities such as yoga. Now, here's what's interesting about the word Om. And I've looked and looked and looked to see if it had a direct meaning because words mean something. So if I say like the word Bible, when we know what that means. If I say the word necktie, well, we know what that means. If I say the word glasses, that we know that what that means. If I say pen, we know what that means. If I say Om, it has no meaning. None. It is a word that is meaningless. It is a word that is empty. It is a word that is void of any understanding whatsoever which sort of matches the, the Hindu idea of heaven, nirvana, because nirvana is the absolute nothing. It's the absence of everything. It is the complete and perfect nothing. So the word Om matches their idea of heaven. Their heaven is nothing, and the word that gets them there means nothing. It mean, has no meaning whatsoever. It's just a sound that has no meaning. And you know what Paul said about that in First Corinthians? Paul, when ta Paul was talking about tongues in 1 Corinthians 14. He said, if I say a word and you don't understand what it means, and I'm like, I'm like a barbarian to you. You get nothing out of it. So it's sort of like the lost word in Freemasonry, which Hiram Abiff knew. The lost word versus the revealed word. So the revealed word is Christ. The lost word is Antichrist. The understood word is Jesus the word that means nothing from a void place would have to be the Antichrist. If Christ is all and in all, then the Antichrist is nothing. And he is, because he's the exact opposite of who Jesus Christ is. So they're worshiping the Antichrist, these Nordic Northern Army aliens created this blue orb, handed it to Betty Andreessen. Here's your go. Here's your little toy or whatever it was. Every t they, and she said, every time I went to see the one, they're the ones that accompanied me there. Now, let's get to, go back to what she described. When they, when they all held their hands out like this and they were going, oh, like that. Um... Six of them formed a circle, raised the arms with their palms upward, and a beam of light came out of their foreheads, forming two interconnected triangles, which made a hexagram. Here's what she was talking about. The hexagram, also known as the Star of David, also known as the symbol called the Megan David, if you've ever drank Mogan David wine, the Mogan David is a form of Megan David or Magan David, and it's their symbol. Or the shield of David was first associated with Jewry as early as the third century uh, on a Jewish tombstone. But later medieval Kabbalistic grimoires bore the hexagrams, the Magan David, as signs of protection against spirits. Grimoires were books of Kabbalistic magic and spells right? So you have angels 
practicing Kabbalah magic. The six of them get together and coming out of their foreheads, that's crazy, was this beam of light and these beam of lights made two triangles that were interconnected. They were basically making an occult symbol. Um, it's the same symbol used on the, the I've mentioned Helena Blavatsky before. Her Theosophical Society, of which Crowley, Aleister Crowley's, Crowley was also a member, this is the symbol that they use. Notice they have the Ankh symbol, which is the uh, sort of the Egyptian cross. You have the two triangles, one pointing up, one pointing down. You have the Ouroboros, the serpent swallowing its own tail, which represents time and eternity, but it also represents... The mouth of the serpent represents the sacred feminine. The tail represents the masculine God. That's all I'm going to say. And basically, and you see the, the X up above it. This is all Blavatsky's idea behind the Theosophical Society was all hidden in all of these symbols and what their meaning is. Uh, here is Eliphas Levi's versions of it. Notice there on the left, Eliphas Levi drew these and he had one of the triangles sort of white and one of them black. And he uses the word Adonai, which is a Hebrew word in the Bible used and it's usually translated as God or Lord. Adonai and then you see the face of a man, the face of an ox, the face of a lion, and the face of an eagle. What is, what is that? That's the chariot that Ezekiel saw in Ezekiel chapter 1. The Merkaba. That's the Hebrew word, Merkaba. Stephen Greer, who uh, is part of the Disclosure Project, who talked all of these NASA and government officials to come out and say, yay, we saw UFOs and we experienced this and we experienced that. He practices a form of meditation and mysticism called Merkaba mysticism. It's part of Kabbalah. And he basically has the ability when him and his people get together to call down these chariots of the gods from the end of the earth, from the north, to come down. Usually when they show up and start their chant, usually the UFOs show up. Then on the right, you have uh, two aged men with a triple crown on their head. One white, one black. Notice their hands are touching and grasping one another. They form two triangles surrounded again by the Ouroboros. You have the macrocosm and the microcosm. Let me explain what that is. Macro means large and micro means little. And those are opposites. And yet... The opposites, again, are fused together. This is why one triangle is white, one of them is black. One of the aged men is white and the other one's black. Here's another representation of it. It's called the, the, the great Kabbalistic symbol from the Zohar. I'm trying to interpret that French. Notice a white man, a black man, joined together by the letters yod He va He. Are you kidding me? You know what those letters are? They call that the Tetragrammaton. That's the letters that make up the word Jehovah or the Lord as it's properly translated in our King James Bibles. They're saying that God is this. This is one of the reasons why Betty Andreessen's mind is so messed up. And what she saw, she actually thought she was seeing real good godly angels, holy angels, giving protection over her, taking her to go see the Creator. Oh. But they're forming sort of the, uh, the fusion of the opposites. And of course, we, we know, if you follow my ministry, you know exactly where this takes us in Scripture. That symbol, the two stars joined together, the hexagram, Daniel 2, verse 43. Whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay.
clay. You go in the Masonic Lodge, you see it there in the form of the square and the compass. It forms the same symbol from this website. It's called the Adonai P Pentacle, and it's supposedly the protector of men. The Pentacle Adonai is used in a, in a serious danger or in danger of death and despair when one is abandoned by all or in complete destitution. I mean, I just went looking all over the internet for this particular symbol, and they're saying here that it's a symbol of protection. In fact, it's, it was, before it was called the Star of David, it was called the Seal of Solomon. Because in one of the Jewish fables that they made up, they have Solomon trapping 72 devils, enclosing them in some sort of box, and putting the Seal of Solomon on that box to trap those devils inside that box so they can't get out, using the two triangles that are joined together and so what we just saw from scripture was those that symbol that hexagram symbol means the joining of the two kingdoms the fourth kingdom the iron principalities powers rulers of darkness spiritual wickedness in high places mingling themselves with the seed of men this is undoubtedly why Practically everybody who said they've been abducted, they were taken onto a ship, they saw little grays, they saw tall whites, and they were interested in one thing. Hybridization, reproduction. The joining together of alien and human. Think of... Um, Gene Roddenberry for a minute. You know, Gene Roddenberry was uh, a, a Freemason. He was a, he was a script writer for various television shows, and he developed the series called Star Trek. What turned out to be the, the most famous, best loved character, if I, if I ask you who is the best, most loved character in all of the Star Trek series, you would say who? Spock. And who is Spock? Spock is the son of a Vulcan ambassador to Earth, an alien and a human woman. And Leonard Nimoy actually said in an interview, you know, the Vulcan sign live long and prosper, they asked him, where did you come up with that? Because Roddenberry didn't tell him to do that. And Leonard Nimoy said when he was a little boy, he was Jewish. And he would go to the synagogue on the Sabbath. And the rabbi would hold up his two hands to bless everybody. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And he would make this symbol out of both hands. A three and a three. Okay, and that's where he got it from. He got it from the Kabbalah. And Spock was half alien, half human. They mingled themselves with the seed of men. Manley Hall says that, and this is what really interests me. Manley Hall said that the hexagram was the symbol for the god Saturn, or let's say the planet Saturn. Here's what he said. Saturn, the old man who lives where? At the North Pole and brings with him to the children of men a sprig of evergreen, the Christmas tree, is familiar to the little folks under the name of Santa Claus, for he brings each winter the gift of a new year. It is the symbol of Saturn. And so the Pope, I always thought it was a cowboy hat. I, I honestly did. I'm going, why is the Pope wearing a red cowboy hat? But it's not a cow, it's not a red cowboy hat. The Pope wears a hat called the Saturno. Look, take a look at it. It's a hat 
and the rim or the brim of the hat is meant to represent the rings of Saturn. And if you want to know what they are, uh, you go to Ezekiel. You can see this in Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10, where in Ezekiel 1 it talks about the wheels of the, of the, uh, the cherubs. And then it talks about, uh, in verse 16, the appearance of the wheels and their work was like under the color of barrel, and the forehead one likeness, and their appearance and their work was as it were a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. As for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful, and the rings were full of eyes round about them four. The, the wheel in the midst of a wheel, and he described the rings, and I think that's the planet Saturn. And now we know, because we can, we've seen it with our telescopes, and we've sent the Voyager out there to take pictures of it, the planet Neptune also has rings around it. But nobody knew that 200 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago. Nobody knew that because we couldn't see it. You can't see it with the eye. But there's Saturn, a wheel within a wheel, those rings and the ball inside of it. And here's the Pope. And anything that goes on the head represents dominion, authority. It's on the top. It represents the most high. And Saturn basically is a representation of Satan or the Antichrist. Because in the old legend, Saturn was the seventh planet. All right? You get that? The beast has seven heads. So does the dragon have seven heads. There's the Pope wearing the hat. Of the, with the Saturn rings around his head, and they literally call it the Saturno. Now, here's what's interesting to me. We didn't know this until the last 20 years when we started taking really close-up pictures of the planet Saturn. And we found out that at Saturn's north pole is a giant hexagon. Take a look at it. And nobody has the first clue on how it's formed. But it's there. And it stays there. It's been there. We don't know for how long. We don't know how long it's going to last. But it's just curious to me that the hexagon and the hexagram, a hexagram has a hexagon in the middle of it, how that symbol would be associated with the planet Saturn for thousands of years, we, and nobody knew that Saturn had rings, and no, certainly nobody knew that at the north pole of Saturn was this giant hexagon formed by the clouds. They actually have animation of it, and the clouds are spinning around that dot there on the north pole, and it's making the symbol of the hexagon. When you mention the North Pole, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Ice and snow. What does snow look like? Every snowflake is a form of a hexagram, a hexagon. Now, I'm not going to get into all the symbolism behind that because there is some good symbolism behind snow in the Bible. Snow and rain represent the Word of God. How many books are in the Word of God? 66, okay? Now, I'm going to kind of change keys here for a little bit. Um, we've had John Mack tell us about the people that he knew that saw these tall whites. We have had Betty Andreessen tell us about her encounter with these tall whites, these Nordic aliens who are part of the Northern Army. He said they all look beautiful. They all look friendly. They all look happy and benevolent and loving and kind and everything like that. Except remember, Satan himself and his ministers are going to appear as angels of light. 
okay? And they take on a false appearance. It's a setup. I'm going to introduce you to a lady by the name of Barbara Marciniak. She has been in contact with some members of the Northern Army, these tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed aliens. She has channeled them by, she turns channel on her TV. See, I, I grew up in the day when you had to get up, walk across the room, and go click, 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 like that. I was the remote control. Mike. Turn it on channel four. That's what my dad would say, okay? Those were the good old days. No, she would channel tall blondes. Tall blonde Nordic Northern Army aliens, okay? Let's look at some things she said. She said, what I learned in school has very little to do with what the Pleiadians, that's who she calls them, have taught me. As a matter of fact, their whole worldview is very radical and yet it feels right to me that we have a purpose that we did not evolve from apes, that we are a genetic experiment, and that our deepest lineage has to do with those who come from the stars. This is starting to make sense to you. When Betty Andreessen sees these Northern Army aliens making a hexagram, and we know what it means according to Daniel, it's the joining of the two kingdoms, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And now we have someone who's been talking to the tall blonde aliens who've told her, oh, you didn't, you're not an accident. We put you here. You see what they just did? What they just did was exactly this just in from God. 2 Thessalonians 2, I don't need to turn there, I can quote it, that he, the Antichrist exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So we know that God put us here, not these tall white aliens, but she was told by... And she's not the only one that says this, trust me. She was told that the tall blonde aliens put us here as a genetic experiment on this planet. And she's their ambassador. Here's one of those channeled messages from who she calls the Pleiadians. They're from the Pleiades, the North Country. Humanity is learning a great lesson at this time. Now remember, this is from a familiar spirit. The lesson is, of course, to realize your godhood. Stop right here. First lie ever told in the Bible was told by the serpent. For God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall ye be opened, and ye shall be as... Gods, knowing good and evil. Mm. And think about it. When the gods mingle themselves with the seed of mortal men, then mortal men become gods. Uh, the lesson is, of course, to realize your godhood, your connectedness with prime creator. That's the one. And with all that exists, the lesson is to realize that everything is connected and that you are part of it all. There are multitudes of cultures and societies that exist throughout the vastness of space. And these societies and cultures have been on and off this planet from the very beginning. It is not just that we, the Pleiadians, have come to assist. We are only one grouping from one star system. There are many who have journeyed here uh, for many reasons. The majority of the extraterrestrials are here for your upliftment, though there are also those who are here for other reasons. Where will this transition take you? We would like to see you become qualified to form worlds consciously. 
you are preparing to seed and be the species planted on many new worlds as they are being formulated. And because you have stored within your memories the history of what has occurred here on earth, you will be able to teach others and consciously hold the direction in which other worlds need to go. And that's Barbara Marciniak from her book, Bringers of the Dawn. Bringers of the Dawn. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the... You know what dawn is? Dawn is like um, sunset, dusk. It's when it's half day and half night. You understand now what that idea means? Dawn, we're going to bring in the dawn. Half day, half night. Those are opposites fused together. Chuck Missler, and I'm not a big fan of Chuck Missler, but he did write a fairly decent book on the alien UFO thing. And here's what he said about the Nordics, and the, this is from his research, the Nordics and the Pleiadians. He said, a Native American tradition widely held that their ancestors were descendants of extraterrestrials from the star system Pleiades. According to UFO folklore, the Pleiadians are a Nordic type of extraterrestrial and are almost indistinguishable from modern man. Throughout history, legend has it, the Pleiadians have had emissaries among us who have assisted in our spiritual development. Standing out, the Star Knowledge Conference organizer spoke of a Sioux medicine man who allegedly has regular visitations by star people from the Pleiades. The legends of Pleiadian contact are not limited to North American natives. In the legends of the Incas, Aztecs and Mayas of Central and South America. There are also references to contact with, quote, star beings from the Pleiades. In an article, ETs from the Pleiades, Robert Stanley notes, quote, religious legends of pre-Inca people state that the universe was inhabited by gods and celestial beings who arrived on earth from the Pleiades. In Bolivia, near Lake Titicaca, are the ruins of the megalithic city of Tiwanaku. Many of the city walls were constructed from blocks that weigh 60 tons, which were further reinforced by metal clamps. Legends relate how it was built in one night by mysterious bearded white men who were giants from Taurus. That's one of the constellations, the constellation of the Pleiades. They are also believed to have descended from the clouds and have had sexual intercourse with Incan women. That is exactly, speaking of the number six, as far as a hexagon is concerned, that is exactly the story given to us in Genesis chapter six. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that. When the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men of old, which were of old men of renown. Again, this is one of the stories that the Bible tells you would exist. The Bible's telling you that, yes, you can talk to the people from the, the Mayans or the Incas or the Aztecs. You can talk with people who are descendants of these peoples, and they're going to tell you their stories that these giants roamed the earth and they built huge cities with 60 tons, sometimes 100 tons, sometimes 1,000 ton blocks. And according to this legend, Tiwanaku was built in one night by tall, bearded, white-complected giants. I've got more on that, but that's for a later watchman, all right? This, again, is from Chuck Missler's book. Among the most prominent teachings from a group of extraterrestrials are the channeled messages of the Pleiadians. The Pleiadians are a Nordic type of extraterrestrials who come allegedly from the star cluster of the Pleiades. Barbara Marciniak, we just saw her and what she said, is one of the better known authors who channels the teachings of the Pleiadians. She claims that her messages have come from hundreds of hours of channeling over the past two decades. In her book, Bringers of the Dawn, she describes the message to mankind from our Pleiadian Space Brothers, which was compiled from more than 400 hours of channeling. 
and was given to impart to us the wisdom of the Pleiadians, a group of enlightened beings who have come to earth to help us discover how to reach a new stage of evolution. Throughout the book, we are given a collection of religious and philosophical messages from the Pleiadians, with the foremost message being that they are our gods, our creators, and that we ourselves can become gods through a process of evolving to a higher consciousness. Let me tell you what that higher consciousness is. Back to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Everything, people, is in this Bible. Everything is right here. So in the same chapter, the Nordics are claiming that they're the ones who put us here, right? We know that that's them exalting themselves above all that is called God or that is worship. What did Solomon say in Ecclesiastes 12? Remember thy creator, with a capital C, no S at the end, in the days of thy youth. Creator, one creator, Jesus Christ. So when they talk about evolving to a higher consciousness, that also is in here. The Antichrist is coming with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. That's the paradigm shift. The great awakening. The new paradigm the new world, the higher consciousness, the big lie. God is going to let this world believe in a strong delusion that they'll believe the lie that these aliens are going to tell. Regarding the nature of God, the Pleiadians told Marciniak, quote, your history has been influenced by a number of light beings whom you have termed God. In the Bible, many of these beings have been combined to represent one being when they were not one being at all. The, it just angers me. I, I'm like David. I hate every false way because the people who believe this, and there's a lot of them, you see, they're slowly releasing more and more information about UFOs from government sources, from non-government sources. More and more people are capturing videos and pictures with their cell phones. I mean, we're starting to wake up here to the idea that UFOs are not just trailer trash, National Enquirer type stories. They're real. And people start looking for answers and then they turn to people like Barbara Marciniak and all of these others, Tom DeLong, Stephen Greer, Whitley Strieber, all of these UFO people, all of them are involved in some form of occultic ideas. There is no new thing under the sun, people. Not at all. So it just angers me that as people start looking into this, they start believing the lies that are being told, and it's going to bring them into bondage. They're going to get a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. Guarantee you. Um, but a combination of very powerful extraterrestrial light being energies. That's who they say God is. They were indeed awesome energies from our perspective, and it is easy to understand why they were glorified and worshipped. Who were these gods from ancient times? They were beings who were able to move reality and to command the spirits of nature to bend to their will. Humans have traditionally called beings God who could do things that the human race could not do. So according, this is um, Missler saying, so according to these alleged Pleiadian entities, God is a collective of beings, ancient teachers, extraterrestrial entities, and light beings. So when the Bible says, that Lucifer shall ascend into heaven, and then he says, I will be like the Most High. That is exactly what's happening here. 
all of these blonde, golden-haired, men-looking, human-looking aliens taking the place. What was it God said? I'm a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. God says, I won't stand for it. Later on, Missler says in the chapter called Ambassadors Through Time, Barbara Messiniak claims that the Pleiadians were a group of highly evolved extraterrestrials from our future who came from a universe that had achieved completion. That is, they had evolved to the point where they realized that they and their ancestors were indeed the prime creator or the first cause. That's, the prime creator is the same person as the one that Betty Andreessen was seeing. They have come to the earth at this time in the late 20th century to help us. According to Marciniak, the Pleiadians told her, quote, humanity is learning a great lesson at this time. The lesson is, of course, to realize your godhood, your connectedness with the prime creator and with all that exists. The lesson is to realize that everything is connected and that you're part of it all. According to the teachings of the Pleiadians, humanity stands at the threshold of a quantum leap of evolution that will abolish religious and governmental systems as we know them. It will bring universal brotherhood of man. Stop right here. You know what masonry is all about? The brotherhood of man. So in order to be brothers, two people have to have the same father in order to be brothers. Ye are of your father the devil sons of Belial versus sons of God oh boy a quantum leap of evolution that will abolish religious and governmental systems as we know them it will bring universal brotherhood of man the realization that we are part of a gigantic universal entity known as the prime creator this quantum leap, this end run of evolution as expounded by numerous New Age gurus, channelers, and authors is the realization that by our own personal evolution we can become part of a collective, part of a universal force, and therefore part of the divine being known as God. Again, this Bible is telling us the truth of what's behind the lies that these aliens, strangers, devils, gods, that they're telling everybody. And God offers, I mean, I've looked at other religions. They have concepts and ideas and things that you would never in a million years understand or grasp, like the Kabbalah. They require strict adherence to certain rituals and certain rules and fastings and all of this. Yes, yeah, we fast every now and then, but it's not a commandment that we must fast in order to be saved. Every one of these religions removes people from the simplicity that is in Christ, whereby somebody can just cry out unto the Lord and God would save them and God would give them everlasting life to live with Him in the New Jerusalem. It's that simple. It was simple enough that I believed it when I was nine years old. I knew I didn't want to go to hell. I knew that. And Paul said, watch out for those who come to remove you from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Jesus. So now that I've read all of that stuff from Barbara Marciniak and these channelers channeling these blonde whites, I see I'm getting, I'm leading into the next watchman where we're going to identify these Nordic aliens for what they are. Devils and familiar spirits. From the north. So I got to wash my mouth out with some Bible verses here. Jeremiah chapter 50. Look at what it says. Verse 41. Behold, a people shall come from the north 
and a great nation. And many kings shall be raised up from the coast of the earth. They shall hold the bow and the lance. They are cruel and will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses, every one put in array like a man to the battle against the O daughter of Babylon. The king of Babylon hath heard the report of them, and his hands waxed feeble. Anguish took hold of him, and pangs as of a woman in travail. You know what that is related to, right? Oh my goodness, I'm in 2 Thessalonians. I got to just go back one page. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. You see, that's the, that's the kick here. These blonde-haired, blue-eyed, heavenly beings who look like they're so full of love. One lady, one lady said that when an alien touched her, she had this overwhelming feeling of love for this grotesque alien. She just fell in love with him. People, that's sick. And they come in and they're setting everybody up to believe the lie that, that we're here to bring peace and safety. See, I think when it says they shall say peace and safety, I don't think that's anybody down here. I think it's those guys that are coming down here to say peace and safety. And when they do, see 1 Thessalonians 5 now is connected with the prophecy of Jeremiah 50 and the northern army. Because it said when they come, it would be as the pangs as of a woman in travail. Then, you know, I go back, to, when I read this, I'm going, wait a minute. They're coming with bows and arrows and lances? And they're riding horses? Why don't we just use a tank and blow them all to bits? That's my point. These aren't earthly horses. These are not arrows made out of aluminum or titanium or wood. Or no. They're far more dangerous than that. And the only way to defend yourself from them is to have a shield of faith in what God said. So Ezekiel 8, 14 then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, Tammuz, however you want to pronounce it. Where were they doing this weeping? This, by the way, it's already Mardi Gras has passed, which means Fat Tuesday. So now the first day of Lent, when I'm recording this, the first day of Lent has already occurred. And Lent, the Lenten period is, get this number the 46 days before Easter, 46 days before Easter. Really? They came up with that one all on their own, huh? But it's about mourning the death of the dying God, Tammuz. And where did they do it? Toward the north. Isaiah 14, 13, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, where? In the sides of the north. Now where is Lucifer at this time? He says it, I will ascend into heaven, and then I'm going to sit in that throne in the north. The north is the heavens, up there. That's where the northern army is coming from. Zechariah 6, and we're going to end with this. I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. And he describes these horses and chariots. Remember what came down to separate Elijah from Elisha? A chariot of fire and a horses of fire. Remember when Elisha said to God, you know, his servant was going, oh, we're surrounded. They're all going to kill us. We're outnumbered. Elisha said, God opened his eyes. And he saw in the, on all the mountains surrounding them 
chariots of fire and horses of fire surrounding them everywhere. This was the angelic realm, right? So now we have these four chariots and four horses, just like what's going to be released in Revelation chapter 6. Same colors, white, black, red, and then sort of like gray. Okay? Zechariah 6 verse 6, the black horses which are therein go forth in, into the north country, and the white go forth after them, and the grizzled go forth toward the south country, and the bay went forth and sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get ye hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth, and they cried upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. And again, put these two together because the black, hmm, the black, yeah, that's Revelation chapter 6, right? We have the black, the white, the red, the grizzled and bay, or the pale, pale, which is like gray, okay? That's Revelation 6 at the opening of the first four seals. This matches what's in Zechariah chapter 6. And these chariots and these horsemen have quieted God's spirit in the north country. Shh. What is God's spirit? Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, this is John 6, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So what, what has this northern army succeeded in doing so far? Getting everybody to quiet the Spirit of God, to shut the Bible up so that it's no longer believed. And now that the Bible's no longer believed, you have these ambassadors like Barbara Marciniak and Barbara Lamb and... Stephen Greer and John Mack and countless others who are all out there telling everybody, George Norrie, who are all out there telling everybody what the aliens are saying, the Northern Army. We're here to bring peace and safety to your planet. And oh, oh, yeah, and we're, yes, you can still believe the Bible, but also the Koran and the Bhagavad Gita and the Talmud, because we actually represent all of the, the world's religions. They all believed in us. And people are believing that. And they're going to continue to believe it until the destruction comes like travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape. So again, what is it that we need now more than ever? Shield of faith. That way we can quench all of these lances and arrows and fiery darts that these alien devil angels are sending out now and will continue to do so until the arrival of that fourth kingdom when they mingle themselves with the seed of men. This is why I tell you, when, when things are going well in your life, that's when you're supposed to take a little time and, and say, God, God, I know things are well right now and I have a lot to thank you for. Not really feeling all that bad, so I haven't prayed much, haven't read the Bible much, but God, I don't think it's going to stay like that forever. So God, when I'm not feeling well, that's when I'm going to ask you to hang on to me the hardest and don't let me go. Don't let me fall. Like these aliens are going to fall one of these days. Now's the time. Behold, today is the day of salvation, people. I love you. Thank you for listening. I've got a lot more. To come, but it's going to be a while because the month of March is here and I got conferences everywhere. So we're going to release the conference videos as we go, but I'm going to get right back and pick up on this 
Woods. I've got way more to tell you. Blavatsky and Crowley and the White Brotherhood and Familiar Spirits and the Witch of Endor. All that's coming up. You are the reason why I do what I do. I thank you for your prayers, your love, and your support. Keep it coming. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.